Hello everyone welcome to our channel University of Political Science. Today I discusses about Cicero and the Roman lawyers. By the beginning of the first century before Christ the political processes which began with Alexander's conquest of the East had in a large measure completed themselves. The whole Mediterranean world had been cast into the melting pot and had become in no small degree a single community. The city-state had ceased to count and there were no politically self-conscious nations such as the modern era has produced. Already it was apparent that the successor to Macedonia and also to Egypt and the Asiatic kingdoms would be Rome, and that the known civilized world would be united under a single political rule, as indeed happened in the course of the century following. By the beginning of the first century, also, the Stoic philosophy had spread the ideas of a world state, of natural justice, and universal citizenship, though these terms had an ethical rather than a legal sense. The stage was set for the further development and clarification of these philosophical ideas. The more negative ethics of the Epicureans and the skeptics the identification of nature with individual self-interest continued to exist, but the immediate future, at least, lay with the ideas developed by the Stoics. These had now become so dispersed that they were ready to lose their identification with any philosophic system and become the common property of educated men. These ideas included a number of convictions having an ethical or a religious import, but no very high degree of philosophical precision. With an ever-increasing tendency of the schools to borrow from one another, they had even lost some of the precision which Trey had in the Stoicism of Chrysippus, as was to be expected when they became current in a culture that was substantially worldwide. They included the belief that the world is the subject of divine government by a god who is, in some sense, reasonable and good, and who stands therefore in a relation to men that may be compared with that of a father to his children. They included also the belief that men are brothers to one another and members of a common human family, in which their rationality makes them as a race akin to God and in some fundamental way alike, even after allowance has been made for the distinctions which diversity of language and local custom create among them. Hence there are some rules of morality and justice and reasonableness in conduct which are binding upon all men, not because they are laid down in the positive law or because a penalty follows their violation, but because they are intrinsically right and deserving of respect. Finally, and perhaps vaguest of all, men were felt to be fundamentally social in their nature. This idea had no such precision as Aristotle's theory that man is an animal who reaches the highest stage of his development in the civilization of the city-state. It suggested merely that respect for the laws of God and man is a native endowment of human nature, and that by following the lead of this innate reverence he fulfills his own nature, while he stultifies himself if he elects to do the opposite. The development of these ideas, in the first century before Christ, and in the two or three centuries thereafter, followed two main lines. The one continued in the direction already indicated by the influence of Stoicism upon the beginnings of Roman jurisprudence, it had the effect of embedding natural law in the philosophical apparatus of the Roman law. The other had to do with the religious implications of the idea that law and government are rooted in the plan of divine providence for the guidance of human life. In both cases the development of a political philosophy was incidental. Of the writers to be considered, only Cicero was avowedly a political theorist, Yet his effort to deal specifically with the political problems of the Roman Republic was the least important part of his work. But though a political theory was incidental to more general purposes in the one case to the construction of a system of law and jurisprudence, and in the other to the construction of a theology and an ecclesiastical organization the resulting nodes of political thought departed widely from the point of view that had prevailed in Greek political theory and exerted a profound influence upon political reflection in the centuries following. Legalism the presumption that the state is a creature of law and is to be discussed not in terms of sociological fact or ethical good, but in terms of legal competence and rights had hardly existed in Greek thought. It has been an intrinsic part of political theory from Roman times to the present. The relation of the state to religious institutions and of political philosophy to theology had scarcely been problems for the Greeks, but they set the chief problems and colored the discussion of every problem throughout the Middle Ages and well down into modern times. In the history of political theory, therefore, the changes wrought in the age just before and not long after the beginning of the Christian era were of momentous importance, 
though they produced no systematic treatises on political philosophy. This article and the following will deal respectively with these two tendencies, the legal and the theological. In respect to dates they lie nearly parallel to one another. Perhaps a world of explanation is required for allocating Cicero to the first and Seneca to the second, thus violating a chronological arrangement and also, as it may seem, slurring over the break which might be assumed to have occurred with the rise of Christianity. The reason for including Cicero in the same chapter with the lawyers is not, of course, either that he was a great jurist, for he was not, or that only lawyers read him. It is merely that his political ideas seem to lay the secular caste, and so a relatively close affinity with those of the lawyers. Seneca, on the other hand, gave a definitely religious bias to his philosophy. The reason for including Seneca with the Christian fathers is to mark the fact that, in the beginning, the rise of Christianity did not carry with it a new political philosophy. Christianity itself and its ultimate establishment as the legal religion of the empire were the consummation of social and intellectual changes that had long been at work and which affected almost equally thinkers who never embraced the new faith. So far as political ideas are concerned, those of the fathers were for the most part those of Cicero and Seneca. For purposes of historical accuracy there is no reason why the Christian era should be taken as beginning a new period in political thought. More informations please visit our website www.politicalscienceview.com Thanks see again to new topics.